We want to welcome Kelly and uh, thank him for investing in our youth this week. And uh, Lord, you will be blessed by the seed that's coming forth today. So Kelly, God bless you. Thank you for giving the word to us today, brother. Good morning. Man, you guys look good today. So do you, Kelly. All right, all right. I see what kind of manners we have in here. I'm just checking it out. No, man, I am honored to be here. My name is Pastor Kelly Kay. I'm an associate pastor at Limitless Church in Kingfisher, Oklahoma, but I'm also a full-time traveling evangelist uh, for almost 10 years now. I travel, I like to say I'm an international evangelist because I preached in Canada once. <laughs> no, but I just travel all over the country telling people about the love of Jesus because there's literally nothing else I want to tell people about. Amen? changed my life. And if you're watching online, I welcome you. Thank you so much for letting me uh, be on your computer or phone. Uh, and maybe you're like, well, you know, some of you may be thinking, and you online too, you, right away, you're like, this guy does not look like a preacher. He looks like he might rob me in the parking lot. <laughs> if you're thinking that today, let me say this to you. I might. <laughs> I'm just kidding, man. Uh, Jesus did an amazing work in my life, changed everything about me, and I'm just honored to be here with you. Thank you for allowing me to be here. Uh, I have a, a photo of my family, maybe, if we, can, if we can show that. I like to show my family. Yeah, there they are. Yeah. Thank you so much. I like to show you my family because if you're seeing me, that means they're not. Right. And I love that people are always praying for me and they say, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for your ministry. I just want to give you a picture of them, but please keep them in your prayers as well. Um, I've been doing this for about 10 years, traveling on the road, and God has given us a grace in our family to allow me to do this. But that doesn't mean it's always easy. And uh, it's a struggle sometimes. My wife is a worship pastor at our church, so uh, she's not able to travel with me a lot. Now, you can tell when you see my wife that she married way out of her league. <laughs> Clearly, <laughs> right? Now you look, I've got five kids. D did you hear me? I said five kids. <laughs> and hang on, one of them is 22 and she's holding the one that's two. You know what that means? I'm tired. <laughs> Pray for us. No, no that, uh, that little one there was a COVID surprise. Yeah. Yeah, I said, uh, that's what happens when you pull a pastor off the road. <laughs> Way too much time on our hands. No, kid. no it's a blessing, but that, that's my family. Uh, thank you so much for, for keeping them in your prayers as well. Uh, one more thing before we jump in. I mean, I am so excited about this message today. I am excited for you. Um, but I, one more thing. I have a book out there available. This is my third book that I've written, and this one is called Think About That for a Minute, and it's a 40-day devotional. The reason I call it think about that for a minute is Psalms 1, 1 through 3 says that if you will meditate on God's word day and night, you will prosper in every season of your life. Who wants to prosper in every season of their life? Yeah, absolutely. And the truth is, all you have to do is think about God's word. It does not get any easier than that. But the truth is, we live in the most biblically illiterate generation of all time. Nobody knows what the word of God says. Nobody knows because no one's looking at it for themselves. So when I was praying over the third book I was going to write, I'm like, God, what do you want me to write about? And God spoke very clearly, and he said, Kelly, the words of Kelly aren't going to change anybody's life. But the words of mine, the words of God will change everybody's life. He said, feed my sheep. So all I did was I'm giving you a scripture every day for 40 days. We break it down. There's an application because the Bible says don't just read it and walk away from it. It says read it and then apply it to your life. So I even wrote the application for you. Here's how you apply it. And there's a prayer for the day. I prayed for you. I literally can't make it any easier to help you get on your, in, on your start. Listen, the first 40 days are on me. The rest is on you, right? Then there's a place for you to write down what God is speaking to you because it should never be a one-way conversation when it comes to God. We shouldn't just complain and then walk away. We should actually have open dialogue and let him speak into us what he wants to change and do in our lives, amen? So I've got these available out there. They're $20 or whatever you want it to be. Meaning if you need it to be $5, that's fine. I'd rather you have the book than have the money. But if you want it to be a million dollars, it can be that too. Now, I've never got a million, but I'm going to keep saying it until someday. No, okay. But this one right here is totally free. It's a free book. It's 100% free. It doesn't cost anything. It's right here, though, and it's free. And there it is. We finally figured it out. That's how that works. Good job. Thank you so much. I stood at a church for 37 minutes doing that, and here they're like, his message is weird. 
We're just trying to give away a free book. Look, that's why you sit on the front row. You never know when the pastor is going to have gifts. <laughs> I'm just All right, man, are you guys ready to jump into the word today? Oh, man, I'm excited. All right, let me pray for us. So we're going to dive in. Father, I thank you for yet another opportunity to spend time in your presence. Father, I thank you that my presence here does nothing for anybody, but your presence here changes everything for everybody. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you today. We thank you for what you've already done, and I thank you for what you're about to do. Have your way. This is your service. Do whatever you want. Father, I just ask that you open up our hearts, our minds, and our ears to receive fresh revelation of who you are. And may we leave different because we had an encounter with you today. God, I thank you that I don't have anything amazing to say, but you do. I thank you for using me anyway. In Jesus' mighty name, and everybody said, amen, amen, amen. amen. All right, all right. I want to ask you a couple questions. I want you to look at a couple questions today. All right, the first one being this. Where am I currently in life? Where am I currently in life? And here's the next question. Where do I want to be? See, what I'm really trying to get at, where am I at life and where do I want to be? I really want you to look at, am I seeing victory in my life like I should? Are we seeing victory in our lives every day? Because the truth is, as Christians, we, we are really good at saying it, you know? You know we have victory. I've got victory, but then we're busted and broken at the altar every single week for the same things over and over and over, and we don't see much victory. I mean, am I, am I wrong? We're constantly praying and begging God for victory. Am I wrong? But the truth is, victory is yours. It's already, let me show you in the word. Don't take my word for it. Deuteronomy 20 verse 4 says this, for the Lord your God is going with you. We could stop there and end the service. If that's all we needed to know, the Lord your God is going with you. I mean, you're not alone. He's going with you. And watch this, it keeps getting better. He will fight for you against your enemies. Not only is he going with you, but any fight you're going to encounter, just sit back. He's going to fight it for you. Amen. Watch this. And he will give you victory. It's a promise. Every word, every promise in this Bible is yes and amen. But you've got to know it. He's going with you. He's fighting the battle for you. And you get victory. That's just the truth. There's no arguing that. There's no debating that. That's just what it is. Watch this. 1 John 5, 4 says this. For every child of God defeats this evil world. And we achieve this victory through our faith. Amen. Come on. There's a few things you got to take notice in that scripture, though. It didn't say everyone overcomes this evil world. It says every child of God overcomes this world. You want to overcome this evil world? You need a relationship with God. But then watch this. Once you have that, it says, how do we achieve this victory? Through faith. Through faith. You know what that means? You have to believe you have it. If it comes through faith, victory is yours once you grab hold of it. Does that make sense to you? Listen, we have so many people terrified that we're not going to be in victory. We're not going to live in victory. But watch this. You can't have fear and faith at the same time. You can't. Did you know that? They both want the same thing from you. What does fear want? It wants you to believe something that hasn't happened yet. What does faith want? It wants you to believe something that hasn't happened yet. What's the difference? Whichever one you believe. You can believe you have victory and you do, or you can believe you're defeated and you will be. But my Bible says every child of God will overcome this evil world and we achieve victory through our faith. Amen? Oh, that's good, huh? Listen, part of the reason we don't see victory in our life like we should the truth is, is we need to stop praying for victory and start praying from victory. You see, God's not going to do what he's already done. He's already given you victory. It's already yours. You're sitting there begging. Have you ever thought about that? We are begging for something we already have. If, if you came to me and, just, and I gave you one of my books, here you go, and then you're like, can I please have a book? And I'd be like, what are you talking about? I just gave it to you. That's ridiculous. It's in your hand. That's us all the time with God. God, please, will you please? He's like, I did. It's yours. Grab hold of it. Let's go. Amen. We need to start praying from victory. Listen, what I want to do today is I want to expose the, the, the greatest weapon that the enemy has against you that we don't even realize is happening a lot of times. I want to expose it because if you understand it, you can fight against it. And you already have victory. Amen. I hope this is blessing you already. Listen, how many times have you heard somebody say, you know, not you clearly, but somebody say, oh, the devil's really hit me hard this week. Devil's really hammering me today. Devil's really getting me in my life. Have you ever, have you ever heard somebody say that? You know, I'll be honest, I've said that a million times. But let me tell you something. The fight that we're in is not circumstantial. 
The fight is not your circumstances. When we run into these circumstances, we like to pretend that that's the fight. That's the devil fighting us. But the truth is, our circumstances and our reaction to it is actually just evidence that we've already lost the fight. It's not the fight itself. You see, the fight itself is not circumstantial, just like victory is not circumstantial. Victory is not the end of a football game. Victory is who you are. See, the fight is not in your circumstances. The fight is in your mind. The battle is going on in your mind all day, 24-7. The fight is right here. That's why the Bible tells us that we need to take every thought captive. We need to renew our mind daily. Amen? Listen, let me tell you something. This message today will, be, will bring freedom to you if you will let it. If you will let it. You see, I'm up here talking about victory, and the truth is, is the devil's already whispering into a lot of your minds saying, not you. You won't ever have victory. You're always going to be beat down. You're always going to be broke. It might work for him. It doesn't work for you. It might work for them. It won't work for you. Listen, that is a lie from the devil. It is straight up a lie from the pit of hell, trying to convince you you don't have what you have. Listen, this will set you free, but you have to allow it to. We have to take our thoughts captive. We have to renew our mind. We're going to get that to a minute. What if I were to tell you, you had the ability to control every outcome in your life? That'd be pretty good news, wouldn't it? If you could control the outcome to every situation, that would be awesome. Listen, I'm going to show you how to do that today. Write this down if you're taking notes. E plus R equals O. That math equation right there will change everything. E plus R equals O. You see, E is for event. R is for reaction. O is for outcome. You see, the event plus your reaction gives you your outcome. The truth is we cannot control the events that happen to us a lot of time, right? The Bible says that we're gonna have many trials. We're gonna have many tribulations, much suffering on this earth. There's gonna be bad things that happen to you. Matter of fact, the only promise I can really give you 100% today is that you're gonna go through hard times in this life, right? It's true. You can't control that. What can you control? How you react to it. And it's not the event that gives you the outcome. It's the event plus your reaction to it. Understand, so many people are beat up in their mind that when events come, they just automatically go to negative. We react negatively. Oh, it's always been this way. It's always gonna be that way. And then we wonder why we have so many negative outcomes. The problem is we need to change how we respond to it. Stop respond to it through looking at the natural and respond to it thinking about what God has already done for you. Yeah, you know what? This situation might suck, but thank you, God, that you've already seen, you saw it before I did, and you've already made a way before me, amen? Look, when you change your reaction, yeah, come on. That changes the outcome. Does that mean the outcome is always gonna be what you wanted? No, but it also doesn't always have to be bad, right? God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. We need to be open to say, God, you can change the outcome however you want. The only thing I can control is how I react to the event, and I give you access to work in my life, amen? That's, that's freedom if you'll, if you'll allow it to be. This is why God tells us, take every thought captive, renew our mind. Let me show you. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5 says this. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. How does the, war, the world wage war? Through circumstances. You do this, I do this. You do that, I will retaliate with this. It says we don't do that. No, no, no. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. Why? Because our battle's in our mind. Our weapons are our thoughts. Our words, right? It says, on the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Watch this. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Let me tell you something. If you're not taking your thoughts captive, they're taking you captive. Somebody is winning this battle. This battle is going on 24-7 in your mind and somebody is winning. You or your thoughts. Now, God speaks to you through your thoughts. You speak to you through your thoughts. And so does the devil. It's pretty, pretty crowded up there. A lot of different voices going on. How do you know which ones are from God? Right here. Does this thought line up with the word of God? If it does not, get rid of it. Get, there are people that have been holding on to hurts and lies for 30, 40 years. They don't line up with the word of God, but they've made it their identity because they meditate on it constantly. And then they wonder why there's no victory. If you're not taking the thoughts captive, they're taking you captive. I've had people ask me, all right, well, Kelly, well, how? How do I take my thoughts captive? Well, I just showed you one. You're gonna run it through the lens of, is this the word of God? 
If it's not, you let it go. That's how you take it captive. You say, I'm not, I'm not thinking about that. I'm not focusing on that. Here's another way, ready? Stop listening to yourself and start talking to yourself. Hear what I'm saying. Stop listening to yourself and start talking to yourself. And I mean literally out loud speaking the word of God. You're like, well, I'm gonna look like a crazy person. I'd rather be a crazy person with victory than a sane person that's all chained up. Start speaking the word of God. Listen, if you start speaking the word of God against your thoughts, your thoughts go away. Did you, have you ever noticed that? Look, I'm gonna count to 10. I want you to count to 10 in your mind. I'll help you. Then when I say, say your name, just say it out loud. All right, ready? Let's count. One, two, say your name. What happened to the counting when you said your name? Stopped. Because your mind can't keep going if you're speaking words because your mind needs to focus on what's coming out of your mouth. Listen, stop listening to yourself and start telling yourself what it's gonna believe. You start telling your mind, this is the truth. Listen, you see, this is not crazy. This is not, oh, that guy's crazy up there. What's he talking about? Look, you see this in Psalms all the time. Listen, I'm not telling you to ignore the fact that you're in a rough situation. I'm not saying pretend it doesn't exist because I have victory. No, you're in a bad situation. You are. Look at Psalms. He's like, my enemies are hard pressed around me on every side. I'm crushed. They're coming after me. But then how do they always end? Well, you, God are almighty, you are Lord, you are above it all. You see what's happening? We're acknowledging the situation, absolutely, but we're not stopping there. We're taking those thoughts captive by speaking the word out loud. That's how you take thoughts captive, but I don't know if you've noticed something. To speak the word out loud, you need to know the word. <laughs> so many people lose this battle because they don't know what the word says. You have to. Listen, here's the, the truth of it. If I invited you over to dinner at my house and I said, hey, I'm gonna cook you a great meal, well, instantly you'd say, no, you're not, your wife is. And I'd say, you're right. <laughs> but if I, <laughs> if I invite you over to a meal at my home and I, you get there and all my nice plates are, are out, not the plastic ones she makes me eat on, but the nice ones for you guys, you know, and the nice cups and there's candles. You're like, wow, Kelly, your home is beautiful. Thank you for inviting me to this meal. And then you sit down and I go get my trash can and just dump trash on your plate. Are you going to be very happy? Are you going to be very excited to eat that meal? You're going to be like, dude, what is that? I'm not eating that. This is crazy, right? That would be ridiculous. But that's what we do every single day with our mind. We just put garbage in there and we just eat it. We just chew on it. Oh, they just garbage. But if anybody would have ever thrown that in front of you, you'd be like, no way. But we do it to ourselves all the time. If you won't do it in real life, if you won't eat garbage, why you, why you meditate on it all day? Amen? Look, Romans 12, 2 says this, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. All right, all right, time out. You're gonna transform us into a new person? How do we do that? Watch this, by changing the way you think then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. You wanna be a new creation? You want God to change everything about you? Well, it starts right here. See, so many people, they come into church, they get saved, they raise their hand, and they walk out the doors and nothing ever changes. Let me tell you, if you've given your life to Jesus and your life looks the exact same as the day you got saved, something's wrong. There's a problem, and it probably starts right here. In your mind, we need to take every thought captive. We need to renew our mind every single day. We gotta start praying from victory and not for it, amen? Look, I'm gonna show you that this is actually not a new tactic of the devil. This is the oldest trick in the book. He's been doing this since day one. Matter of fact, this is the only fight he has. All he can do is lie to you and hope you believe it. You see, the truth is the devil's been defeated and he knows that. He just hopes you never figure it out. Because if you figure it out, then you will take authority over him and you will start to see victory in every area of your life. He hopes you never figure it out, but let's, let's expose it today. Watch this. In Genesis 1, verse 27, it says, so God created human beings, what? In his own image. In the image of God who he created them. Whose image were you created in? God's. Who are you built like? God. All right, that's important. Moving forward, Genesis 3, 1 through 5. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat from the fruit in the trees of the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, watch this, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. 
What was the deception here? What was the lie? That you'll be like God. Because what is the truth? Whose image was she created in? God's. Who is she already like? God. Listen, the only trick of the devil, the only thing he has is to make you believe you don't have what you've already got. He can make you doubt that God is good. He will make you think God is holding out on you. He hasn't given you the best, but the truth is you've already got it. He tried to convince her you don't have what God said you have. That's the only thing he has to do. That's all he's got. The choice is, are you going to believe him or not? Are you going to believe it? Listen, let me show this to you again. In Numbers 13, 30 through 33, this is when... uh, they were leading the Israelites to the promised land. Moses was leading them to the promised land. And they get there and they're going to send in the 12 spies to check it out. Now, hang on. What is it called? It's called the promised land. What does that mean? It's theirs. Listen, this land is theirs. Why? Because it's promised from God. See, you have a promised land too. God has speak, spoken this promised land into you. He, there's promises that he's given you, plans for your life. It's a promise. That means it's yours. Look, this land was already theirs, but they're going to send in 12 spies to go check it out. Make sure that they can take it, which you don't need to do. It's already yours, but all right, they're going to go check it out. They come back. It says, but Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let's go at once and take the land. He said, we can certainly conquer it. Listen, that's truth. That's truth. It is their land. It was already a promise. He's speaking truth here, but watch this. But the other men who had explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. They're stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report about the land amongst the Israelites. The land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers, and that's what they thought too. Now, let me be real, all right? It's truth. They were way bigger than them. This looked like a hard fight. But what's the greater truth? It's already their land. It's promised to them. Now, I understand where it says we felt like grasshoppers next to them. I get that. Because when you look at your situation, it probably feels huge to you too. And again, I'm not telling you to deny what's real. Maybe you're in a rough storm right now. Maybe your life's in a hard place right now. Don't deny it and pretend it doesn't exist. But just acknowledge the greater truth that Jesus has already overcome. So, so have you. I understand that. We felt like grasshoppers next to them. Here's what I don't understand, the next line. And that's what they thought too. How do you know? You're a spy. (laughs) How many spies do you know that come into the enemy and be like, hey, would you like to go get some coffee with me? Let's sit down. All right, now we think we're gonna attack you. Do you think you could beat us or do we have a good chance? That doesn't happen. Here's the truth. You don't know what they think. You have no idea what they think. That was a lie from the pit of hell. We look like, they look like, they look like giants next to them. They're huge. And that's what they think too. Yeah, yeah, they think, they think that too. They, see, they know they can destroy us. Oh my God, we're never gonna make it. Now watch this, watch this. One man, two actually, said, hey, we can go take this land. 10 others, no, we can't. And they said it spread amongst all the men of Israel. And we know the story. Did they go take that land? Nope, sure didn't cost them a lot of years in the wilderness. Here's what I want you to see. Your stinking thinking will affect more people than just you. Don't think it's only on you. It will spread to your entire home, your family, the place that you work, your friends, everywhere. Be careful about what thoughts you allow to run through your mind because they're not just gonna be yours. It's gonna spread. Similarly, be very careful who you allow to speak into your life. If somebody's speaking over you and it doesn't line up with the word of God, Thank you so much. Would you just go ahead and put that right on the shelf? That doesn't line up with what God has spoken over me. That's not the truth. We need to be very careful what we speak to others and also what we are allowed in our mind from others. Amen? Now, the Bible talks about the mind 95 times. If you include every time it talks about your head, it's 306 times plus 95. This is a lot of times. What I want you to see is this is important. This is an important topic. And so the Bible mentions several different types of minds. I want to give them to you. I want to show you what they look like so that you will be better equipped to go out and fight the battle. Because the truth is, if you think coming to church today is you serving God, you've missed it. 
Coming in here is not you serving God. I'm so glad that you come. Please don't stop. But when you come here, this is not your service to him. This is you getting equipped to go out and serve him. Amen? The battle's out there. The battle's in here, but it's also out there. We need to get equipped in here. So that's what I want to do. I'm going to show you. Here's the first one, the right mind. The Bible says we should have a right mind. Listen, in Mark 5, you get the story of, of a legion where Jesus lands. He goes across the, the, the lake, and he gets off in the Decapolis, and there's the demon-possessed man in the, the cemetery, and it says he had a legion of demons, so many. And Jesus is going to do what Jesus does. He casts out the demon, heals the man. But watch this. It says, then they came to Jesus and they saw the one who had been demon possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. Here's what I want you to see first off. If there's a right mind, there can also be a left mind. (laughs) Wrong, I'll just check it, make sure you're awake. Yeah, a wrong mind. If there's a right mind, there's a wrong mind. Understand what this means is are your dominant thoughts right? Your dominant thoughts, what you think on the most, does it line up with the word of God or does it not? He's saying you need to be in the right mind, focused on the truth, focused on things that are right, that are real. Listen, this dude has been living in a cemetery. Wouldn't it be great if Jesus gave him a house? Yeah, but he didn't. Maybe give him a wife. That would help him. That'd straighten him up. Yeah. (laughs) Didn't give him a wife. Didn't give him a job. Didn't give him money. Didn't give him a home. What did he give him first? A right mind. Because if your mind's not right, you're not going to be able to get anything else. Your mind's got to be right first. Before he can do anything else through you, he needs to heal your mind. Listen, I know your finances may not be right yet. Is your mind? Your family may not be right yet. Is your mind? Your job may not be right yet. My question is, is your mind? When you get your mind right, everything else starts to follow. But it starts with having the right mind. Amen. Here's the next one. I love this one. The Bible says we need to be of sober mind, sober mind. Now I will be very honest with you. Most of the time when I hear this scripture, it's in regards to the question of should Christians be allowed to drink alcohol? And I live in Oklahoma where marijuana is legal there. And should Christians be able to use marijuana medicinally? And in the scripture I hear in return is, well, we need to be of sober mind. And I get that, but let me, let me read it to you. Let's really look at this. This is in Titus 1.8. Now, it's talking to bishops, which is just elders, uh, leaders, pastors in the church, but being a sober mind applies to every one of us. It says this, For a bishop must be blameless, a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, and self-controlled. I get that we say sober-minded and we need to, you know, not be drinking alcohol and getting drunk. Absolutely, I agree with that. But let me show you this. It also says in here, not taken to wine, meaning these two things are separate. They're not together. He mentions wine, but then he also says be of sober mind. Let's look at that deeper. Let's, wh- why does it say that? Well, what happens when you have too much alcohol? What happens when you become inebriated? I mean, I've never done it. You know, we've never done that ever but you know somebody you have, right? Now listen, whenever you become uh, inebriated, you drink too much, what happens? Everything becomes exaggerated. Everything. Something that is very slightly amusing. Oh my gosh, this is the funniest thing in the world. <laughs> no, it's not. That's dumb, <laughs> right? Or something, something small that's not, you know, some bad little thing happens. Oh, it's the worst thing that could possibly happen. Really? Not really. It's really not that bad. Listen, A sober mind is a mind that doesn't exaggerate everything. Being sober-minded means you're not blowing things out of proportion. Oh, my life is awful. It's a mess. God, where are you? This is the worst thing that could possibly happen. Is it really, or are you just having a bad day? Do you see what I'm saying? We blow things out of proportion. Make it look way worse than it is, and God is saying, no, we need to be a sober mind. See things for how they are. Don't build it up and make it to be something it's not. Listen, so many Christians are like, you know, I don't drink. I don't drink. Awesome. But their mind does. Their mind is intoxicated on what? News? Social media? Films? Movies? Music? Whatever. Listen, what has been intoxicating your mind? To make you believe things are worse than they are. Or to make you think things are better than they are. It says we need to be a sober mind. Not blowing things out of proportion. Seeing it for what it really is. Amen? Here's the next one, the sound mind. 
We need to have a sound mind. Now, we all know this scripture, right? First, or 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Now, we all know what the scripture says, but the truth is, if I were to ask in this room, what does that mean? There's going to be probably a lot of different answers. We're not really all together on what is a sound mind, so let me help you out. Can I, can I take off my jacket? Is that all right? I have a tattoo. It's like really hot up here. Just one tattoo. <laughs> oh, Lord, help us. He's, he, I know he's going to rob us in the parking lot now. <laughs> he's in a gang. Linda, look, he's in a gang. I'm kidding. All right, listen, we need to have a sound mind. What is sound? Listen, think of it like this. Sound equals not sick. A healthy mind, a sound mind is a healthy mind. Listen, the actual definition of sound mind, it says it means the person has sufficient mental capacity to understand their actions. Do you understand what you're doing? Do you know what you're doing? Listen, sound equals not sick. Now watch this. I'm not a doctor. Clearly, I'm not a doctor. But the truth is you can find any, any sort of research on the internet. You can go talk to a doctor and they will all confirm this. There are diseases and, and sicknesses that can take over your body and they stem from your mind. That is just a proven fact. Your mind will cause sickness in your body. If your mind is not sound, it can literally cause cancer in your body. Listen, here's a few of them. Heart disease, depression, IBS, diabetes, panic disorders, migraines. Those are some that they are accredited. The medical world will say your mind can cause these things in you. That's that's not a sound mind. Is your mind healthy? Is, Is it Is it thinking the right things? Are you able to control your actions? Look, it said a person has sufficient mental capacity to understand their actions. Have you ever met somebody that's just bitter? So bitter, unforgiving. And if you ever just break it down and ask them why, they have no idea. I don't know, it's just how I am. It's how we've always been. And they're the same people that everything is extreme. Going back to sober-minded, right? Like when things are bad, oh, it's really bad. When things are good, oh, it's really good. And they can't tell you why it's like that. It's because they don't have a sound mind. Is your mind sound? Listen, here's let me, the best example of an unsound mind. Let's, let's say that Pastor Kent is taking a nap, he's asleep, and I go over to his house and I just put a big piece of Limburger cheese right on his forehead, you know, stinky cheese. He wakes up and he's like, it stinks in here. Man, my house stinks. Then he goes and gets in his car, like, man, my car stinks. Stinks in here. Gets to work. This office stinks. This church stinks, guys. Uh, goes to Walmart. This store stinks. Everything stinks. Now, what is the truth? Does his house stink? Does his car stink? Does this church stink? No. What is it really? It's his head. You see what I'm getting at here? When you don't have a sound mind, everything is just awful. You got no idea why, but everything is just bad. It's just nothing ever works. It's your mind. It's not those places. It's not those people. It's not the things. It's your reaction to it. You need to change it up here. You're losing the battle up here. If everything is awful everywhere you go, that is just a sign that you've lost the battle up here. Amen? Listen, before I get to the last one, let me, let me tell you this story. Um, I, I travel all over the country with Kingdom Youth Conference. It's the last traveling youth conference in existence, and I'm honored to be a part of it. And we see God show up and move in mighty ways, miraculous healings all the time. And I love praying for healing for people. And one day I was preaching, and this girl came down for the altar call, and before she even got there, God said, I'm going to heal her back. So I knew she had a bad back, and I went and asked her, and sure enough, she did. And I started praying for it. And I knew God was going to heal her because he told me he was. Now, normally when I'm praying for somebody and God starts to heal them, I don't know how it works for you, but for me, I normally feel a heat, like it gets real hot, like my hand will get hot or their back will get hot, and I'm praying for it, and it's not happening. And I'm like, God, what's the deal, man? Like, you said you were going to do this. <laughs> what? I'm like praying, like, is it getting any better? She's like, no. I'm like, God, yo. Because <laughs> the truth is I can't heal anybody. Only Jesus can. Right, but he told me it's my job to lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So I believe that. So I'm praying for it, nothing's happening. And then out of nowhere, God spoke to me and said, Kelly, I need to heal her mind first. If I can't heal her mind, she's never gonna have healing in her back. And then he started to show me thoughts that she was having. And I started asking her, do you struggle with this? Do you have thoughts of this? And she just started losing it. Yes, I do. I said, God wants to heal your mind so that he can heal your back. Understand A lot of people pray for healing constantly and they're never gonna receive it because they're sick in their mind. And if God was to heal your back, it wouldn't do any good because you're gonna get right back to the place you were because it's your mind that's messed up, not your body. 
if you will get your mind healed, watch what God does in the rest of you. I'm telling you, God set her mind free, and almost instantly her back was healed. Boom. It was one after the other. But I'll never forget that moment when he said, I want to heal her mind first so that she can even grasp the reality of what's happening to her back. Amen? The last one is the spiritual mind. We need to have a spiritual mind. Romans 8, 6 through 8 says this, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Oh, who wants some peace today? Yeah, me too, right? It says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it's not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Listen, this says we need to have a spiritual mind. What does that mean? We need to be focused on spiritual things. We need to be focused on the word of God. We need to be focused on heaven as being our destination. We need to be focused on what God is doing. But let's get real. For most people, the only time they're spiritually minded is right now. Right here at church, we're spiritually minded. Because you gotta be. Because there's this big guy yelling at me with a microphone. And I can't think about nothing else but what he's screaming at me, right? Listen, I get it that you're spiritually minded here. But what happens when you leave here? We shift our focus from God back to our circumstances. And again, start begging for victory that you already have. Just shift your focus. Focus on spiritual things. Watch this. You said you wanted peace. I asked you. Most of you raised your hand. And the ones who didn't, you were lying. And I'm going to preach repentance later, so no big deal. (laughs) Let me show you another scripture. Isaiah 26.3 says this. You will keep him in perfect peace. Ah, here we go. Perfect peace. All right, how do you do that? Whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Listen, the reason you get perfect peace when you have a spiritual mind is because you're not bothered about the situations in your life. Because you know that James, or or I'm sorry, Matthew 6 says that he saw the need before you. And he's going to provide for your need. When you're spiritually minded, you have peace because you remember, I'm going to overcome this world because I'm a child of God and I'm overcoming it in my belief in what he's done. There's peace to that. When bad things happen, the events, when you change your reaction, guess what? You change your outcome. And it all comes back to being spiritually minded. You see, here's the truth. What you magnify in your life, you will see in your life. If you magnify all the problems and the trouble, guess what you're going to have more of? Problems and trouble. That's why my Bible says, oh, magnify the Lord. Listen, the reason that that things never work when you magnify your problem is because your problem looks huge. And God looks so small, but it's because you've magnified the problem and you've pushed God aside. Switch that. Magnify God. Now look at your problem. That's not so bad. That's not a big deal. God, you are so much bigger than this. You stay in perfect peace. Why? Because you're spiritually minded, not just on Sunday. Amen. And let me, uh, let me conclude with this band. If you want to come back, you can. And I love to use the word conclude because I read somewhere that when you say the word conclude, 70% of your audience re-engages with you. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> I'm still here. <laughs> Let me conclude with this. Got you all now. So many people lose this fight in their mind because they don't know what this says. Let me show you how important that is. I want to show you really, because I'm like, oh, yeah, read our Bible. Yeah, we get it. You know, I've heard that since I was a kid. Yeah, you get it, but are you doing it? Look, this is why it's so important. Even Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tested. He went through rough times. He went through trials. Why? So that he could relate with us on every single level. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness. Pay attention. You can be going through rough seasons sometimes, and it's not the devil's fault. God is leading you there. Why? Because he's trying to build your character. He's trying to prepare you for the blessing that you're not able to hold right now. He wants to prepare you for it. And the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. Now, somebody quote me the scripture where the Holy Spirit led him out. Yeah, there's not one. It's not one. How did he get out of the wilderness? Every time the devil came to tempt him, what did he say? The scripture says. The word says. Every thought the devil tried to plant in his mind, Jesus replied with the word of God. He stopped listening to himself. He started talking to himself. He was sober-minded. He didn't blow it out of proportion. He was right-minded, focused on what was right, and he was spiritual-minded, focused on his father instead. Do you see what I'm saying? Everything we're talking about, that's exactly how Jesus overcame. And we gotta do the same thing. Look, let's go back to the beginning real quick. Let me show you how important this is to get in the word yourself. Remember we 
we're reading in Genesis about Eve and Adam and the tree. Do you think it was a coincidence or just an accident that the devil tempted Eve instead of Adam? Let me tell you something, that was tactical. There was a reason for that. Let me show you the reason. In Genesis 2, 15 through 18, it says, the Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden. Who? The man. To tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you're sure to die. Then the Lord God said, watch this, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper just right for him. Was Eve there? when God spoke revelation to Adam about not eating from the tree. Not at all. She came afterwards. You see, this is why it's so important that you get revelation yourself from God. See, what Eve got was secondhand revelation. Adam got direct revelation. You see, it's very hard to steal away a direct revelation from God because God spoke it to you. Oh yeah, I'm not believing that. God spoke this to me. You can tell me whatever lie you want, devil. God spoke this to me. When you know that you know that you know it came from God, who can take that from you? Nobody. But watch what happens here. God tells Adam that, then he creates Eve. Now I'm sure Eve got there and Adam was happy. Boy, I guarantee you she looked good. And he's like, let's go walk through this garden, girl. Come on. You see that right there? Hippopotamus, yeah. I named that. What? <laughs> Rhinoceros. That's what I'm working on next. Ah. They're walking. Then he's like, oh, oh, by the way, by the way, hang on, hang on. You see that tree right there? That tree? Yeah, yeah. We don't eat from that one. Mm -mm. Don't eat from it. Don't look at it. Don't even touch it. If we do, we will die, girl. You stay away from that tree. Right? Adam told her. And how do we know that? Watch. Genesis 3.1. The serpent was the shrewdest of all wild animals. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat from the fruit of any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat from the fruit in the trees of the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit in the tree in the middle of the garden we're not allowed to eat. God said, watch this, you must not eat it or even touch it. Did God say that? Nope. Who did? Adam. Why did the devil target Eve? Because she had secondhand revelation. She just heard it from somebody else. You see, I love that you come to church every Sunday to hear a word from the pastor, you hear a word from me, but understand when you come and hear me, you come and hear him, what you're getting is secondhand revelation. You're getting a revelation that God spoke to him. You're getting a revelation that God spoke to me, but God reserves the right to speak it to you first, personally himself. Listen, my favorite conversations I have after church are when, and it happened last service, when somebody walks up to me afterwards and they said, everything you said is exactly what God's been speaking to me all week. Amen. That's how this should work. God is speaking to you. You come here and now your revelation is affirmed and now it's even more difficult to steal away. Not only did God speak about it, but then that next week my pastor said the exact same thing. That's how this should work. If the first time you're hearing anything from God is on Sunday, man, there's so much more for you. It can be so much better. Listen, I get it. Sometimes you're gonna get revelation from me, but you also need to go back and see it in the word. Don't just take my word. For, don't just take any pastor's word for it. Get in the words yourself. Does this line up? Does it match? Does my spirit recognize that spirit and what's being spoken over me? Amen. Look, I'm almost done. Let me show you this. Remember at the beginning, I said when the Israelites were going to go take the promised land, they sent in the spies and they said, man, we are like grasshoppers in their sight. And that's what they thought too. Remember that? That lie from the devil. And we know it was a lie, right? Because we know it's the promised land. But wouldn't it be cool if we knew what they were thinking? Wouldn't it be cool if we actually knew? If we could prove that that was a lie, wouldn't that be really awesome if the Bible told us that? Did you know it does? It does. You just got to read a little further. I'm telling you, the Bible is fun, guys. It's not a boring book. This book is amazing. Watch this. It tells us, and that's what they thought too which is clearly a lie from the devil. To find out what they thought, though, you got to go to Joshua. See, you remember the battle of Jericho? What happened? The walls just fell. Did they even have to fight? No. Do you know that that's them taking the promised land? That's the first battle of them taking the promised land. Watch this. The promised land. It was theirs, right? It was always theirs. They didn't even have to fight. God just knocked down the walls. But watch this. Before they went and marched around it, they sent in spies again. And they were staying with Rahab. 
And Joshua 2, 8 through 10 says, before the spies went to sleep that night, Rahab went up on the roof to talk with them. Watch this. I know the Lord has given you this land. She told them, we are all afraid of you. Everyone in this land is living in terror. For we have heard how the Lord made a dry path for you through the Red Sea. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? And they think that too. No, they don't. They don't think that. That is a lie. And you bought it and you believed it and it cost you years. You could have had your promised land that day. But because of one lie, one sentence, you believed it and it cost you dearly. How many of you have bought a lie and it has cost you dearly? They didn't think that. They were terrified of them. It says, we heard about what your God did at the Red Sea. That was way before they sent the spies in there. While they're in there spying out the land, going, oh my gosh, this problem is so big. And it, it knows it's bigger than me. The truth is, the problem was terrified of them. The promise is always yours. What lie has stopped you from receiving it? What lie have you bought and held on to that has kept you from the best that God has for you? What lie is keeping you from victory? Because my friends, victory is yours. Amen. Now this is an all day, every day type of thing. This is 24 seven, every single day, this fight is going on. We have to be aware of it. And that's hopefully what I've helped you with today. You can leave better equipped to fight this battle because you know what's going on and you know how to take thoughts captive. So you want the truth? This morning when I woke up, I didn't wake up feeling victory. I didn't wake up being like, yep, I'm gonna knock the crap out of the devil today. And the devil didn't wake up today going, dang it, Kelly's gonna preach against me. Mm. He's gonna teach him how to fight me. Oh, what a bad day. That's not how it worked. I woke up this morning getting hammered by the devil. In my mind. They're not going to pay attention to you. They think you're just a youth speaker. They're not going to listen to you. Look at you. You don't look like a pastor at all. What are you even doing there? Nobody knows you. They're not going to buy your books. You, you got bills to pay. You got things. Ain't, it ain't going to happen. Nobody's going to want what you got. Nobody. Do you see what I'm saying? This morning, I wake up like that. So I started reminding the devil out loud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But every child of God overcomes this evil world. And we do it through faith. Our victory comes through faith. I start reminding him of his own word. Who am I, he says to me. Who are you, Kelly? Look at you. And I said, yeah, well, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am the masterpiece of God. I am the righteousness of Christ. But understand, if I hadn't been in this all week, I'd have no fight. If I hadn't been in this all month, all year, this whole decade, I wouldn't know how to fight. But when you realize it's the enemy speaking to you and you've got a weapon against it, that changes the game. I might have woke up feeling defeated, but I stand before you in victory today. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So let me pray for you. I'm done. Bow your head, close your eyes. But before I pray, I want you to think for a minute. I want you to think about yesterday, last week, last month, this whole last year. What are your dominant thoughts? Are they right? Do you have a sober mind? You've been blowing things out of proportion? Do you have a sound mind? Do you understand your actions and why you're doing them? Is your mind healthy? Do you have a spiritual mind? Or are you just focused on all your situations, everything going on around you? You see, if you're here today and you say, you know what, I need to change my mind. The really cool thing about that saying, I need to change my mind, if you really get deep down and understand what you're doing is it's called repentance. See, repentance doesn't mean be ashamed of your actions. My Bible says it's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. And what repentance means is it's a change of mind that leads to a change of direction. If you realize today your mind needs changing, that's a great place to be. Because repentance is what gets us as close to God as we want to be. So I'm gonna ask you this morning, who needs to repent? Who needs to change their mind? change their direction. If that's you today, just raise your hand. I'm going to say a prayer for you. Yeah, I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. Oh, so many. Amen. My hand's up too. Thank you, Father. Thank you for what you're doing in this place right now. Father, I thank you for every hand that was raised, that is acknowledging in this moment today 
God, my mind is not right. Maybe my mind is not sober, it's not sound, it's not spiritual. But today, Father, I realize I've been losing the battle and it's been taking place in my mind. Today, Father, I take every thought captive so they can't take me captive. My focus is on you. God, I thank you that you have perfect peace for me because I'm keeping my mind set on you. God, I thank you for what you're doing in this room right now. There's so many hearts of repentance that is changing their mind changing the direction back to you. God, I thank you that we can start praying from victory. We don't have to beg you for it because you already gave it to us 2,000 years ago on the cross. Father, I thank you. And if you're in this room today and you say, you know what? I've never had the mind of Christ. I've never actually given Jesus everything. I don't have victory. I can't pray from victory because I don't have it. I've never received it. Or maybe you have given your life to Jesus, but you feel a million miles away. The truth is, I don't care how far away you feel, you're only one step back. If you're here today and you need to give everything to Jesus for the first time or for the five millionth time, I don't care. Put your hand up so I can say a prayer with you today. Yeah, I see you, man. I see you, 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 bro. I see you, I see you. And maybe I didn't point at you, I see you. Maybe I didn't say I see you. It doesn't matter if I see you or not. I can't save anybody. I can't change anybody. Only Jesus can. He sees you right where you are. So if that's you today and you want to believe in your heart that Jesus is, who he says he is, he died on the cross just for you. If you're ready to change your mind and change your direction, what I'm going to do is help you confess with your mouth he is Lord of your life. The Bible says that's how we get saved. We believe, we confess with our mouth, and then we repent, which means we change our mind, which is exactly what you're doing. So we're all going to pray together out loud. Just repeat after me and say, Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for giving your life to me. Today, I give my life to you. Forgive me of my past. Forgive me of my sin. Make me brand new. I'm changing my mind and I'm changing my direction. I'm running after you. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen, amen, amen. Doesn't it feel good to have the right mind? Oh, there's freedom in this house today, amen. Thank you, Holy Spirit.